So we're going to uh, look into, I guess you say, kind of like do a little short series, uh, Christmas series. We're going to uh, we kind of look at the, at the beginning of looking at kind of like a, a historical part of it, how um, how things came into being, how things got into power by the time Jesus was born. And so what we're going to do in the next few weeks, we're going to uh, look at the background that surrounds the, uh, the birth of Jesus. We're going to look at uh, the background of the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire, how it became to be the empire of the day, the, the power that it was when Jesus was born. And, you know, we're going to look at uh, Herod the Great and how he came into power and uh, who he is and his rule and his reign. And then we're going to move into the story. We're going to look at uh, Joseph's and Mary's stories going coming from the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. And then after that, we're going to... Uh, look at Jesus' birth, you know, the angels and the shepherds. And then probably the last week in December, we'll look into the wise men and their journey into the into Bethlehem and, and how they found out that Jesus was born. So with that being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, gather around to, to look at the history of of the events that surrounded the birth of our Savior. And Lord, we pray that as we uh, dig into these events, we pray that you give us the understanding, uh, open our eyes to see that your word does not, is not opposed to archaeologists and the history books of secular of the world, but Lord, that, it, that your word uh, works with, uh, complements other historical books. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the question is, how many of us ever wondered what happened What happened between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew? I mean, if you read the Old Testament, you get to the end of Malachi, and then you finish Malachi chapter 4, and you jump right into the New Testament, and you pick up with the Gospel according to Matthew. And so... Uh, with that being said, I'm, not too many of us know of the history in between the two testaments. Uh, Nehemiah's work in Jerusalem in Nehemiah 13 and Malachi's ministry ended around 425 B.C. The announcement of the birth of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1 happened approximately 6 to 4 B.C. And so this period between the end of Malachi's ministry and the announcement of John the Baptist is called the 400 years of silence. And it was silent in the fact that there were you no know, prophets speaking for God. God wasn't speaking to any man. But it was not silent as far as the affairs of the world are concerned. There was a lot going on during those 400 years. God was at work. He was working in the background to bring the Roman Empire into being by the time Jesus was born. And so that's what we're going to look at today is the background to the Roman Empire. And so this uh, 400 years of silence ended with uh, the angels announced with the, birth, uh, the birth of John the Baptist. And so what was going on? during those 400 years. And with that, we need to go back to the book of Daniel. And you may say, well, what does this have to do with the Roman Empire? How, how, how does this tell us how the, the Roman Empire rose to power? Well, well you remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream in, Jan in Daniel chapter 2? He had a dream that, dis that disturbed him, and sleep left him in uh, Daniel Chapter 2, verse 1. And so he ordered the magicians, the enchan enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans. He ordered all these people to come up to him. And he wanted them to tell him 
the dream he had. And of course, none of them could uh, tell him what his dream was about. And so he ordered all of them to be killed. And of course, uh, Daniel heard about it. Daniel said, wait a minute, let me speak to Nebuchadnezzar. Let me talk to him. And so that's how Daniel came to Nebuchadnezzar. He revealed his dream to him. And so he was able to interpret that dream. So that brings us to Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 35. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image here was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest until a stone was cut out with, without hands, which smote uh, the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. And so he continues to interpret the dream and tell him what it all it means. And, and so the statue represents five kingdoms or five empires that will come in the course of history. Uh, the first one is the, the head of gold, which represented the, the Babylonian Empire. It, it, they ruled about somewhere between 626 B.C. and 539 B.C. Second is the Medo-Persia Empire. It ruled somewhere around 539 B.C. to 333 or 331 B.C. It, represented, it was represented by the silver chest and the arms. And of course, one arm represented the Persian side of the empire. The other arm represented the Medo or the Media side of the empire. And of course, the dominant one was the permanent I mean, the Persian Empire. Third is the Greece or the Grecian Empire. It rose from 331, 333 BC to 146 BC. Represented by the bronze or the brass belly and thighs. And then the fourth is the Roman Empire by the iron legs, 146 BC to 476 AD. One leg represented, represented the Western Empire and the other leg represented the Eastern Empire. And so then later in the future, the revived Roman Empire, which is represented by the mixture of the, the clay and the iron toes. And so the same Empires are represented by the four beasts that Daniel saw and then his vision in Daniel chapter 7. But again, you might be wondering what does this got to do with what we're looking at how, now and how does this relate to Christmas? Well, do we, it's going to get a little, I guess you would say, complicated, confusing. I hope I could try to clear it up a little bit. Kind of get a, this is going to be more like a, I guess like a brief history lesson of the, uh, the time between Malachi and the book of Matthew. And so then we're going to look at this in the past and how it led up to the Roman Empire. And so at the time of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the Babylonian Empire was the one in power. Nebuchadnezzar was the sole ruler at the time. They destroyed the Assyrian Empire. And of course, this included the ruling over the Jews. Uh, they also uh, conquered Egypt and Judah. And so they would carry the people of Judah into captivity in three stages. The first stage would include Daniel. And so that's who we're looking at now. The second stage included Ezekiel. And so the Babylonians would rule the land, the land of Judah, and all the other ones for about 87 years. And it is possible that during their time in the Babylonian exile, 
that the Jews began building synagogues and started worshiping in these synagogues. And you remember reading the book of, or reading in the Gospels, how many times have we read that Jesus sent at the synagogue? It was his custom going to the synagogue on the Sabbath. The synagogues were probably started during this time. And so this will bring us to the Medo-Persian Empire, which conquered uh, the Babylonian Empire. And how many of us remember Cyrus the king? He was the king of Persia at that time. And you remember, he decreed the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. This can be found in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Um, so, let me get to it real quick. Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, King Cyrus's proclamation. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in the writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the charge, or all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remains in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods, with beasts besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So one group went out with Zerubbabel back to uh, Judah to rebuild the temple. That's found in Ezra chapter 2. The work was stopped, but Darius decreed, it, decreed for it to continue. That's in Ezra chapter 6. Another group went out to Judah, and the second group that went out went with Ezra. And this is found in Ezra chapter 7 and chapter 8. This is on the rule of Xerxes, king of Persia. A third, but a smaller group, went out with Nehemiah, and that's recorded in Nehemiah uh, chapter 2. But he would go and rebuild the walls and, and uh, around Jerusalem. So the Persian Empire would rule, would control the land of Israel for approximately 200 years. And they would rule about 100 years after Malachi's ministry comes to an end. And so this is where we pick up with the intertestamental period between Malachi and the book of Matthew. And so the Persian Empire is, of course, what we said a few minutes ago, is the silver chest and the arms of the statue. This empire is the beast that Daniel saw that was like a bear in Daniel chapter 7, verse 5. It raised itself up on one side, represented the, the dominant empire, which was the Persian side. The three ribs represented the three nations that it devoured. So you will go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, and, and read this. It says here that Daniel uh, saw another beast, a second one like unto a bear. It raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between its teeth, the teeth of it, and they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. And so the Persian Empire devoured uh, possibly three nations, which were Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. And of course, they included the land of Judea. Even though Judah, the land of Judea or Israel, is controlled by the Persians. They still allow them a little bit of freedom to worship. But they were governed by Syria. Uh, they were allowed to um, return, rebuild, and worship at the temple in Jerusalem. They lived in relative peace. 
and it was uneventful time, uneventful time. They allowed high priests to rule in Judea, but they were accountable to the Persian government. I mean, they had to uh, give an account for what was going on. And so this led the office to become political, which led to jealousy and rivalry between some of the priests. And it's recorded that one of the priests has killed, is said to have killed his brother within the temple. It was also during this time the Israelites fought with the Samaritans. And you remember from the the Samaritans were a mixed breed between Jews and uh, Gentiles when they were taken into captivity. Well, guess what they fought over? A place of worship. The Jews rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans built the temple in Mount Gerizim in the north. Do you, do you remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Remember she was speaking with Jesus? She said to Jesus, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So the Samaritans built a rival temple for them to worship, but of course it was later destroyed. And so because of this, it separated uh, the worship between the Samaritans and the Jews. And so this brings us to the Greek or the Grecian. Empire was represented by the brass, a bronze belly and thighs. And guess who the leader was of this empire? Many of us remember him in history class. His name is Alexander the Great. He was there from 336 BC to 323 BC. This is the leopard in Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7, verse 6. He says, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. This, this leopard implies swiftness, and Alexander's uh, conquering the nations. He ruled from Europe to Africa to India, which made it the largest empire at that time. You have uh, wings of a fowl which adds more speed to him. He has four heads which represent the four generals that ruled after, after Alexander's death. They divided the kingdom amongst themselves. They ruled Macedonia, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. And of course Judea, uh, Judea was also controlled by them. And of course, they were under the rule of Ptolemy I, Sator, or Sotor. Uh, different commentaries and different Bible dictionaries give it a different name. Alexander defeated Darius III, which ended the Persian Empire. As far as the Jews were concerned, Alexander allowed them to continue to worship and observe their laws, but he introduced Greek culture to them. But also mm -hmm. in but he also introduced it to the nations he conquered. His purpose was to unite all people under one culture. And it came along with this came the Greek language. And what language was mm -hmm. the New Testament written in? It was written in the Greek. So even though the New Testament was written many, many years later, that shows that uh, the Greek influence continued, uh, continued to influence them for years to come. And so it was the spoken language at that time. When Alexander died in 323 B.C., a struggle began among his generals. And so as a result, the uh, empire was separated into four divisions, as mentioned by Daniel chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. Daniel says, 
And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. And the gray horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So that tells us that, that the uh, four generals ruled his land. It was divided. Ptolemy, Ptolemy I, Soter, founded the Ptolemies of Egypt. They controlled Israel from 320 B.C. to 198 B.C. Israel was controlled by the Egyptian Ptolemaic Empire. Many Jews lived in Alexandria. And it was also at this time that the Old Testament was translated into Greek, which is called the Septuagint. And many of us may have may have heard that. It was translated by 72 scholars. Six from each tribe were sent from Judea to Alexandria to do the work. 198 BC, Judea fell under the control of, of the Syrians. Antichius, Antichius III, the Great, had defeated Ptolemy V Epiphanes. I know some of these names get kind of confusing and Sometimes they're hard to pronounce. So he could try he gain control of the land in Daniel chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times, in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall be any strength to withstand. But he that comes against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. It was under the people or land, a uh, leader called, a uh, nation called Seleucid. They controlled until 143 B.C. That's recorded in Daniel chapter 11, verse 17 through 35. The Jews had freedom of worship until the Seleucid control. They demanded, or they determined to force Greek culture on the Jews, that is the Hellenistic culture, Antichius IV, Epiphanes, ended the Jerusalem practices, the cultures, and I mean the, uh, the, the you know, rituals and ceremonies and all that. In 170 or 168 BC, Antichius set about to destroy the Jewish religion. We looked at this here several weeks ago. He desecrated and plundered the temple in Jerusalem. He ordered the Hellenization of the Jews, forbade them from keeping their laws, outlawed the rites of circumcision, forbade them from observing the Sabbath and celebrating their feasts. Copies of scriptures were ordered to be destroyed and they were forced to eat pork. These laws were forced for cruelty, and anyone guilty of violating them were put, were put to death. And so the thing we looked at several weeks ago, was in the, when we looked at the book of Daniel, when I was talking about Matthew 24, he desecrated the temple. He set up an altar dedicated to Jupiter. He sacrificed a pig in it. And of course, this was considered an abomination to the Jews. And so he was the first pagan ruler to persecute the Jews for their faith. And this led to the Maccabean Revolt in 165 B.C. A man named, by the name of Mattathias Mat Mat refused to offer a required pagan sacrifice. He killed a Syrian general or officer. 
and fled to the mountain or to the hills and called on the Jews to join him in rebellion. His son Judas, called the Maccabee, rallied the Jews to revolt against the Syrians. They waged war against him and they succeeded. And guess when that day was? December 25th, 165-164 B.C. They marched into Jerusalem, entered the temple, cleansed it from this altar, this uh, to Jupiter, cleansed it so they can uh, reinstate the, the daily Jewish offerings found in Daniel chapter 8. And this is still celebrated today. Thousands and thousands of years later. You see on many calendars, many Jews still celebrate it. It's called the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah. It was also called the Feast of Lights. So after 24 years of fighting, the Jews finally gained independence. But their freedom will be short lived. Their freedom lasted from 165 BC to 63 BC. And this leads us to the coming of the Roman Empire. They are the iron legs mentioned in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 2. But the beast that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, this is how he described the empire. After this I saw the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I consider the horns, and beheld, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in his horn were eyes by the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking in great things. So this empire cannot be described by any earthly animal. Daniel, now Daniel could say is, this fourth face was dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. The empire began somewhere around 753 BC and it centered around Rome. The empire was already growing at this time by gaining the Mediterranean region and it would become one of the greatest empires ever known to man. And it will be revived during the last days, actually a lot of end time people believe it's already somewhat come together. There's, I think, there's, I think it said like 28 nations. A form has formed a league at, years ago, and so this will be the revived empire. So they were the greatest empire on the face of the earth. They would defeat the, uh, the Carthaginian Empire and take over the territory of Africa and Hispania, which is modern day Portugal and Spain. They would continue to push eastward into Greece, Asia, Syria, and Gaul, which is modern day France, part of Belgium, Western Germany, and Northern Italy. Then they have the Maccabean revolt, gain independence from the Syrians. Imagine that. And during Judea, Judea's brief period of independence, a civil war broke out. The descendants of Math Mattathias founded the Hasmonean dynasty, led by John Arcanus. They took over the office of the high priest and began to follow the Hellenistic principles or practices, the same practices they at first resisted or fought against. 
Aristobulus I was the first of the Maccabean rulers. He was succeeded by Alexander Janius, which left the kingdom to Salome Alexandra. Aristobulus II eventually ruled the region. Altogether, nine rulers would take the throne. Each one of them will be corrupt and it caused eternal strife. The country became unstable. As we mentioned, civil war broke out. This caused the Jewish leaders to seek the Roman Empire for help. A Roman general by the name of Pompey would come in help them out, and when he came in, in comes the Roman rule. He intervened between Aristobulus II and Hyrcanus II. Antipater, or Antipas, favored the cause of Hyrcanus against Aristobulus. Aristobulus tried to defend Jerusalem against the, against the Romans, but in 63 B.C., Pompey sacked Jerusalem, and the nations came under the rule of Rome. In 47 B.C., Antipater was made procurator of Judea by Julius Caesar. And guess who appointed governor of Galilee to be governor of Galilee? He appointed Herod the Great. When Julius Caesar was murdered, Herod fled to Rome and won favor with Mark Antony. In 37 BC, the Roman Senate appointed Herod, known as Herod the Great, King of the Jews. He was a Dumian, also known as Edom by birth. He became a Jewish proselyte by marriage, and Greco Roman, and Aldo. He ruled Judea from three from 37 BC to 4 BC. Of course, he was the king when Jesus, the King of the Jews, was born. What Daniel revealed from Nebuchadnezzar's dream is unfolding in this section of history. What we learned in history class tells us what Daniel already prophesied. You know, and he didn't know the names, but we do. For his prophecies came to life as the years roll on. Many people try to discredit the Bible by saying it's irre irrelevant. I tried to say it's got contradictions in it. Some people may say it's vague. But I have to say that it's spot on. That God orchestrated everything to fall into place. Mm -hmm. And he purposed it at, at the right time. Yeah. Just because the names was not specifically called out does not, should not, discredit the Bible. All the secular history books should be um, added to, you know, should complement the Bible. So when I prepared this message, I tried to use all kind of Bible commentary, study Bibles, everything I had in my office to prepare this message. But I was getting excited about how uh, God revealed to Daniel what he said was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Happen. That's right. This makes the Bible come to life. History books are not at odds with the Bible. Now, maybe there's one little side note, neither is science. Mm -hmm. Science works with the Bible. 
history books with the Bible. And so hopefully this should, this should encourage us to continue to read the Bible. Actually, hopefully this will stir up our desire to read more of the Bible. Get a study Bible and see how history is unfolding and how God already made it known yep. long before it ever came to be. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to look at history. And Lord, we pray that, that uh, we will be excited about what you have said in the past and how it's coming alive, coming to pass now. Lord, we pray that, that we will see that your word is alive and that it is powerful and that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we pray that you will stir our desire, our desire to dig into your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name.